Steps to Life is opening God's Word with you. Welcome to the Steps to Life Camp Meeting 2002. God calls for a spiritual revival and a spiritual reformation. Unless this takes place, those who are lukewarm will continue to grow more abhorrent to the Lord until He will refuse to acknowledge them as His children. Stay tuned for revival and reformation messages. Our wonderful Father in heaven, we come before you humbly once again through the wonderful person of Jesus, your dear Son, who we know intercedes with his blood and his righteousness in our behalf as we come in faith to you this morning, asking the blessing of your Holy Spirit upon our meeting once again. We want to thank you, Heavenly Father, for the words that you have spoken to each one of us in previous meetings thus far in this camp meeting. We pray that you will bless now our dear sister, Margaret Davis, that you will guide and direct her thoughts as she opens your word to us right now. We pray that you will give her the thoughts and the words that will touch our hearts that will make a difference in our lives as we see more clearly the message of righteousness by faith, a message that you have given to your people in these last days, that in possessing this message, in receiving it, it would prepare us to be received by Jesus in the day of his coming. Oh, help us, Heavenly Father. Open our eyes. Make us lights in the midst of the darkness of these last days. May the true message of hope and salvation be within our hearts. May we have the joy of your salvation as our prayer. We thank you now for thy presence as we pray in Jesus' worthy name, choosing to believe and asking you to help our unbelief. Amen. We do have special music at this time. Brother Tony is going to favor us with another special. Thank you very much. Greetings again. This precious song is a song of Sister Davis's selection because it is in harmony with her precious messages and especially the message that we're about to hear from her in a moment. I thank the Lord for the precious message and messages that we're receiving today. Amen. Oh, to be like thee. to be like the blessed redeemer this is my constant longing and prayer gladly i'll forfeit all others treasures jesus thy perfect likeness to Blessed Redeemer, pure as Thou art, come in Thy sweetness, come in Thy fullness, stamp Thine own image deep on my heart. Oh, to be like Thee. Loving, forgiving, tender and kind Helping the helpless, cheering the fainting Willing to wandering sinners to find 
surrender ourselves to Christ, then we start the fight of faith. It is called the good fight of faith in 1 Timothy 6, 12 and 14. When souls are converted, their salvation is not yet accomplished. They then have to run the race. But that race is not falling all the time. That race is running the race. You are to leave aside your sins and the things that so easily beset you. And those are left right here at the altar of sacrifice. And then you are to run the race with Jesus. We read in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, Wherefore, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. What are the weights we lay aside? It says the weights are the evil habits and practices that we have formed by following our own natural dispositions. So when you come to Jesus, you have these past habits that you formed while you were following your own way. And now you are to lay them all aside. Your mind is not cleansed from the habit patterns. It's cleansed from a wrong way of thinking. You have a new mind, not a new brain. Do you see the difference? Yes. It's cleansed and it's given a new way of thinking. And now your thinking is directed toward God. Then, as you constantly yield yourself to God, He can work in you to um, give you power to resist the old habits as they come tempting you. Remember when you are born again, your flesh is not made new, right? You still have the sinful flesh. Jesus had to live with that sinful flesh. 
and you have the old habit patterns that you developed, but the Holy Spirit is stronger than those old patterns. And as you yield to God, moment by moment, as you are walking with Him, new habits start forming. And then it will make it easier for you to walk the walk, to fight the fight of faith. And at the beginning you might stumble quite often. Don't get discouraged. Because your, your human nature wants to follow your old way. But you need to understand how to meet temptation of your lower nature. Each day he must renew his consecration. Each day do battle with old habits, hereditary tendencies, will strive for the mastery. Against these he is to be ever on guard, striving in Christ's strength for victory. Every Christian must stand on guard continually. I'm on page 44 of the book. Watching every avenue of the soul. What are the avenues of the soul? Hearing, sight, sound, taste. All of these avenues of the soul have to be watched. That you don't allow anything to settle in that is wrong. You will be tempted. God has never promised that in this life we will be free of temptation. But he has promised something better. He has promised that he can give us victory over temptation. The tempted one needs to understand the true force of the will. It is through the will that sin retains its hold upon us. And so you need to know how to use the will. There's another statement, and you know it very well. Everything depends on the right action of the will. Now, you can use the will and be a legalist and fight temptation and try to fight Satan in your own strength, and it will not help. Oh, you will keep from killing someone, but you'll have hate. You see? In order to keep sin out of the heart, you need the Holy Spirit. And so we need to know how to use the will. Everything depends on the right action of the will. We're quoting from Steps to Christ. And so let's just examine how it works. First of all, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Here is a promise that Christ has given us. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. We're on page 46 now. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation do what? Also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Tremendous promise. We read in our High Calling 323, our Heavenly Father measures and weighs every trial before he permits it to come upon the believer. What does he do? He measures and weighs every trial before he permits it to come upon the believer. Will this person get trials that he cannot bear? Yes, he will. Will this person get trials he cannot bear? Yes, he will. He's not in the fortress. This person is in a fortress. He's in the holy place. All the power of heaven is available to him. 
and nothing can touch him except what God permits. Mount of Blessings, 71. So it was with Christ. And with every temptation, God has promised what? A way of escape. A way of escape. What is the way of escape? We need to know that. It is very important. You could learn all these other steps perfectly. And if you don't know the way of escape, you will stumble. You will fall. We need to learn the way of escape. God considers the circumstances and the strength of the one who is to stand under the proving and test of God. And he never permits the temptations to be greater than the capacity of resistance. If the soul is overborne, the person overpowered, this can never be charged to God. But the one tempted was not vigilant and prayerful and did not appropriate the faith by faith the provisions God had abundantly in store for him did not take the way of escape that's why we fall Christ never failed a believer in his hour of combat never the believer must claim the promise and meet the foe in the name of the Lord. But how do we often meet the foe? When Satan comes through your children and he tempts you to get impatient, what do we often do? We forget the Lord and we deal with the children. And we are fighting Satan in our own strength. I know, I did it. I didn't take the way of escape. I didn't know the way of escape. And when I first surrendered to the Lord, I still didn't know the way of escape. But I knew. I knew I understood how to surrender. I knew I understood what was involved. I went to the Lord and I, I gave him my heart and I gave him my heart sins. I had given him the sins of the world long ago when I was a young girl. Uh, I never cared about those things out there. But my heart now, my impatience, my irritation, my resentment toward my husband, that was my biggest sin, my resentment. Oh, we didn't have big fights in our home. But you know what it's like. If... if if a husband is selfish and he is harsh with the children, even though he doesn't fight, even though he doesn't lose his temper, then I resented that. I resented his selfishness, especially with our boy. And now I came to God and I said, Lord, I can't, I can't continue that. I can't have that and be in a saving relationship with you. Here it is. I give up my right to resent my husband no matter what he does. Take it from me, Lord. Change my heart. And as I surrendered that night, the Lord immediately changed my heart. He took away the resentment and I had a free spirit toward my husband. And and I had a forgiving, understanding spirit toward him. And I said, thank you, Lord. Thank you so much. And I expected to keep from falling because the Lord has promised. He is able to do what? Keep you from falling. And so I rose the next morning. Um, joyous in Christ and and he was going to keep me from falling <clears throat> but I hadn't learned the way of escape 
in all of my searching because that that was right at the beginning and uh, so the next morning I got up and nothing tempted me all day that I can remember and until the evening we were having family worship in the evening and I was reading from a book on prayer it was a good book but it had not uh, the sentences hadn't been constructed too carefully because it had not been carefully edited and my husband is an editor and as I was reading from the book all of a sudden he corrected a sentence problem and I didn't like that when he did it at worship it was bad enough when he corrected all of us during other times but at worship time I felt it took away the spirit of worship when you concentrate on grammar instead of the the thought and a good number of times through the years if he had done his correction during worship I had bucked it and worship had been spoiled who spoiled it I did I reacted I spoiled it but who did I blame him of course it's easy to do it's the natural thing to do when we react to someone it's the natural thing to blame the other person And now, here I was. I had surrendered the night before, and here was temptation. And as soon as he did that, immediately I reacted. And I said something. And of course, worship was spoiled. Instantly, the Holy Spirit convicted me. I had sinned. And I blurted out in front of the family, I have sinned. Well, that was a shock. <laughs> my, my son, who was at that time about 23, he was sitting there and, and uh, uh, years later he was in a meeting where I was sharing these things and he came up to me and he said mom how well I remember that night <laughs> that was the first time I heard you take the blame you see children notice when we excuse our sins and blame the other person but I had learned from my father you see my sins weren't like my father's but they were sins nevertheless and I asked forgiveness and I went to my bedroom and I pleaded with God to forgive me and to again cleanse me and then I pleaded with God to show me how to keep from falling. Show me the way of escape so that I will be able to bear it without responding in a negative way. Well, he didn't come and show me and I didn't find a text that evening but I believed he would so I rose the next morning confident that he would show me how this works and how to find the way to have victory consistently and throughout the day I don't remember any temptation coming to me until the evening and in the evening, 
I was again reading from the book on prayer. And as I was reading, there was a sentence problem, and my husband corrected the sentence problem. Instantly, I felt the temptation. It says the Christian will feel the prompting to sin. Here is where Christ's help is needed. Instantly, the Lord reminded me, you gave up your right to resent your husband, don't you remember? I said, yes, Lord, and I really meant it. Instantly, the Holy Spirit took charge of my heart. I didn't have to resent. I didn't have to say a word. Nobody even knew I was tempted. I had a forgiving, understanding spirit toward my husband. After all, why should I make a fuss? And I had found the way of escape. The moment you sense a tug to get upset, I'm here, Lord, I need you. And if you are committed to him, he will work in you whatever you need to take care of the problem. God is able to keep us from falling. Why do we fall? Because we let the lower, the lower nature command us. That's why we are not yielding to God. We are yielding to the lower nature. And you will have the lower nature with you until Jesus comes. Then you will have a new nature of the flesh. But you are tempted through your lower nature. And Satan uses those avenues to get through to you. Did I find text? Yes, I did. Isaiah 30, 21. <clears throat> Isaiah 30, 21. And thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying... This is the way. Walk in it. When you turn to the right hand or when you turn to the left. So the moment you sense you are tempted, the Holy Spirit will try to alert you. And if you're at all in mind of listening to the Holy Spirit, you will sense Him alerting you. This way, child, not that way. And whatever words he says to you, with me, the first time I realized it, he, he said to me the very words that I made in my commitment. And if you are having a real problem in reacting to someone, make it very definite in your surrender. I give up my right to react to that person no matter what he does. You see? Make it very definite. Then the Holy Spirit has the right to alert you. This is what you said. You gave up the right. Yes, Lord, I meant it. Instantly, he can take charge. He doesn't do it automatically. You have to choose. Every time you are tempted, you are giving a new choice to choose Christ instead of Satan and the lower nature. Voices inspired by God are crying, This is the way, walk in it. If men will hear the voice of warning, if they will trust to God's guidance and not to their finite judgment, they will be safe. Faithful sentinels are on guard to direct souls in right paths. Did you know that the good angels can read your minds? The evil angels cannot, but the good angels can. And it says they have words prepared for you that you can say when you're tempted or when you're needing help, when you're uh, being harassed by Satan. If you will only be aware of their input. Keep the conscience tender 
that you may hear the faintest whisper of the voice of Jesus. The faintest whisper. We want to become so sensitive to holy influences that the lightest whisper of Jesus will move our souls. And that's what happened the first time I had supernatural victory. The lightest whisper, and I said immediately, yes, Lord. Instantly, he could take control. Conscience is the voice of God, heard amid the conflict of human passions. When it is resisted, the Spirit of God is grieved. How do you grieve the Holy Spirit? By resisting when he's trying to keep you on the right path. Was there a question? No? That's five testimonies, 120. We're on page 46 of the book. The Bible says in Ephesians 4.30, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit will not compel men to take a certain course of action. We are free moral agents. And when sufficient evidence has been given us as to our duty, it is left with us to decide our course. He does not compel us. If we do not want him to control us with his spirit, with the fruits of the spirit, he won't. We can get angry anytime we want to. Then I found another verse, and a desire of ages quoting that verse, which helps even more. It's in James 4, 7, and 8. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will do what? He will draw nigh to you. And when God draws nigh to you, what does the devil do? He flees, and Ellen White says, mysteriously, the temptation loses its power. You don't even feel that you're tempted. That's how it works. It's not you doing it, it's God. It's not you getting the victory, it's seeing God behind the promise. And he working in your heart. You cannot control your impulses, your affections, as you would like. But God can. If you will only submit. And when you're tempted to get upset, you have to submit very quickly. Because how quickly do feelings take over? When the thoughts go wrong, the feelings follow. And so we have to remember the way of escape. This text is quoted here in Desire of Ages 131. And it tells how Jesus got the victory. Jesus gained the victory through submission and faith in God. How did he get the victory? Here I am, Lord. I need you. I'm being tempted, you see. Submission and faith that God would keep him from falling. Jesus gained the victory through submission and faith in God. And by the apostle, he says to us, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. We cannot save ourselves from the tempter's power. He has conquered humanity. And when we try to stand in our own strength, we shall become a prey to his devices. But the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. Satan trembles and flees before the weakest soul 
who finds refuge in that mighty name. This is the way of escape. This is the way Jesus did it. Not even by a thought did he sin. Does that mean no wrong thought came into his mind? No. Wrong thoughts were there from Satan. Satan tried to get through to him in every way possible. Sorely he was tempted on the point of hasty and angry speech. Never did he yield, not even by a thought did he give in, that he had a right to get angry. Why? He had given up those rights. He was not going to act by his own will, he was going to act by whose will? The will of the Father. The will of the Father. Not my will, only thine, Lord. And he was not going to fight his own battles with Satan. He was going to depend on the power of the Father to fight for him. Like I mentioned before, <clears throat> if someone is aggravating you, let's take children because this happens day by day. And a child is being naughty. And you are sensing, you've told them what to do, you've told them maybe twice, and they still don't do it, or they're still upset, and pretty soon you are tempted to have a wrong spirit. And you go into the battle with the child, forgetting it is Satan prompting that child to be rebellious and trying to get you to fall. That's what's involved. And instead of praying for the child and yielding yourself to God so your spirit can stay right, you are angry with the child. And that poor child is fighting a battle with Satan and you are joining Satan. I mean, that's what happens. And yet we've all done it, haven't we? How sad. If you can't instantly submit to God when you are being tempted by a husband or wife or child, take yourself out of the situation like Ellen White said she did. Go into the bedroom and pray so that your response will not be wrong. It will not be on Satan's side. Human effort of itself is not sufficient. Without the aid of divine power, it avails nothing. God works and man works. Resistance of temptation must come from man who must draw his power from God. And so even though you draw the power in the morning through surrendering yourself to God, at the point of temptation, what must you do? Submit to God. Submit to God before you deal with the problem. Then the power is there to resist. God wishes us to have the mastery over ourselves, but he cannot help us without our consent and cooperation. Acts of the Apostles 4.82 the Divine Spirit works through the powers and faculties given to man. And so he works in you love and patience and kindness so that you can work it out. That's righteousness by faith. As soon as we incline our will to harmonize with God's will, 
the grace of God stands ready to cooperate with the human agent. As soon as we make that decision. But if you are double-minded, can he help you? And the Bible says, Let not the double-minded man think he shall receive anything from the Lord. And so many people are double-minded. They want to serve God, but they want to do their own thing. And when they are tempted, they, yeah, they want victory, but they also want to vindicate themselves. You see? Double-minded. And God has to stand helpless by, watching us fall, because we don't want him to control us. Around every tempted soul, there are angels of God ready to lift up the standard of righteousness. If the tempted one will only show a spirit of resistance to evil. But it is not the work of good angels to control minds against the will of the individuals. If they yield to the enemy and make no effort to resist him, then the angels of God can do but little more than hold in check the host of Satan that they should not destroy. At the moment you are falling on Satan's ground, what do the good angels do? They couldn't help you not to fall because you didn't want them to. You didn't submit. But what can they still do? They can keep you from death at that moment. Isn't that wonderful? Our God loves us. He doesn't want us to be lost. And they have the right to keep you from death at that moment. God always gives us a chance to repent. Always. It says, if, if, um, so that they should not destroy until further light be given to those in peril to move them to arouse and look to heaven for help. Jesus will not commission holy angels to extricate those who make no effort to help themselves. And so if we do not take the way of escape and we fall into sin, God is still there with his angels. They cannot help us to keep from falling, but they can keep us from being destroyed. Every rebellious person has a guardian angel to keep him from being destroyed until he has a chance. God is faithful. You know, we always thought only good people have guardian angels. Oh no. Every person has a guardian angel trying to lead him to Christ. But they can't help them keep from falling unless they ask, unless they want. They can keep them from destruction. <clears throat> to go forward without stumbling. I'm on page 48, middle of the page. To go forward without stumbling, we must have the assurance that a hand all-powerful will hold us up and an infinite pity be exercised toward us if we fall. How much pity? Infinite pity if you fall. We must have that assurance. We are not walking a tightrope. We are walking with God. But we are walking on the water. We have to walk by faith. My husband wrote a book, of course, you can walk on water. All of his books were printed at the Review and Herald, um, except the last two. Um, and. You know his book, How to Be a Victorious Christian? Elder Pearson took that book. That was the first that we put out on this topic. 
Elder Pearson took that book to Vienna at the general conference session. He held it up before the whole conference there. And he said, this book should be in every home. And when I first started sharing these things, I went to the general conference. Four of those men sat down with me for a whole evening, listened to what I was sharing, and they all gave me their blessing. They said, Mrs. Davis, you have found real religion. And so I have not had a problem going around except uh, when people think I'm connected with the independent movement. That's the only way I have a problem. And I'm not connected. I'm serving God. And I know God wants the message of salvation to go to everyone, and so I come here too. Because I love you people. What if I fall? There's much more I'd like to share share here. Our time is running so fast. There are thoughts, first of all, a little more on temptation. How are we tempted? The Bible says in James 1, 13 to 15, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. Uh, Desire is a better word. The Revised Standard Version says desire. When we read lust, people usually think of sexual desire. But this includes any wrong desire. Desire to defend yourself in Satan's way. When you are tempted by any desire, as the temptation comes to you, you sense, have you already sinned? No. It's when you yield that you are sinning. You are in, when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. So you sense the temptation. It says the Christian will feel the prompting to sin. Here is where Christ's help is needed. As you sense the prompting, whether it is appetite or, or feelings or anything, as you sense the prompting, you sense the desire, this is where Christ's help is needed. At this moment, submit to God. Temptations will pour in upon us, for by them we are to be tried during our probation upon earth. This is the proving of God, a revelation of our own hearts. You see, when you are tempted, what does it show to you about the lower nature? That the lower nature could get angry, right? It shows you what your lower nature could do when you are tempted. But you don't have to follow the lower nature. You don't have to yield to the promptings of the lower nature. At that moment, you can yield to God, and you are shown where you have a weakness. Do you see? It's not unconscious sin. It's just showing you what your lower nature could do. There's no such thing as unconscious sin. Don't believe the people who talk about it. There are secret sins. But what are secret sins? You have hidden anger, hidden bitterness. You know it. Nobody else knows it. Hidden resentment, hidden jealousy. Those are secret sins. And those all come before God. That's in your heart already. And you know it. And you are convicted. There can be sins of ignorance. Sins of ignorance are not sins in the heart. 
they are maybe you don't know about the Sabbath you don't know about unclean meats you don't know about a lot of reforms those can be sins of ignorance God does not count that sin to you until you are enlightened. Do you see? God is very careful with his people. He does not condemn them for something they know nothing about. Now there is only one thing that you will lose heaven over if you don't know it. If you don't know how to come to Christ. But even heathen will be in heaven who never knew the name of Christ. Why? They yielded to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit filled them with God's love. And they are in a saving relationship. Do you see how simple Christianity is? It has to do with the heart. It has to do with your inner being your mind and your heart the Lord is very gracious very kind my grace is sufficient for thee for my strength is made perfect in weakness as thy days so shall thy strength be we are to live only one day at a time how many days? one day at a time we do not have to do the work of a lifetime in a few hours. We need not look into the future with anxiety. For God has made it possible for us to be overcomers every day. Are you overcoming or are you being overcome? That's on page 48. The only hope for us, if we would overcome is to unite our will to God's will and work in cooperation with Him hour by hour, day by day. Work in cooperation. The Christian life is one of daily surrender, submission, and continual overcoming. That's the Christian life. When we fall, we go on Satan's side. Now, there's much more here, but you can study it in the book. One more. There are thoughts and feelings suggested and aroused by Satan. Where do wrong thoughts come from? Satan. There are thoughts and feelings suggested and aroused by Satan that annoy even the best of men. But if they are not cherished, if they are repulsed as hateful, the soul is not contaminated temptation is not sin Jesus was tempted in all points like we are tempted an impure thought tolerated an unholy desire cherished and the soul is contaminated if we would not commit sin we must shun its very beginnings. Every emotion and desire must be held in subjection to reason and conscience. Every unholy thought must be instantly repelled. That's why the Bible says, bring every thought into submission to God, into subjection. Every thought. And so when a wrong thought comes to you, don't accept it. Don't think that you are manufacturing it even. Now it might come from your past. Uh, you will remember your past. And those wrong thoughts can come bombarding you of things you have put in your mind. As they come into your mind again, do not accept them anymore. Turn from them. And put your thoughts on Christ. Our High Calling 85, do not for a moment acknowledge Satan's temptations as being in harmony with your own mind. Turn from them as you would from Satan himself. And then your feelings won't go wrong if wrong thoughts are not allowed in. 
If the thoughts are wrong, the feelings will be wrong. And your thoughts and feelings combined are your moral character. That's the real you, like we said the other day. That's your moral character. That's the only thing you can take to heaven with you. All right, what if I fall? There's much more here in this area, but we must jump to this other one. What if I fall? What is Jesus doing if I fall? The moment you fall, Jesus is praying for you. He's praying for you before you fall. He sees that you're going to fall even. Because he sees you're not watching carefully enough and so forth. But he is praying for you like he did for Peter. I have prayed for you that you fail not. That your faith fail not. And as Peter was denying his Lord, Jesus was praying for him, wasn't he? Yes. Even while the crown of thorns was being pressed on his head. And and he was being whipped. Jesus was praying for Peter. And that's what he does for us. Even before we fall. The same compassion that reached out to rescue Peter is extended to every soul who has fallen under temptation. It is Satan's special device to lead man into sin and then leave him helpless and trembling, fearing to seek for pardon. But why should we fear when God has said, Let him take hold of my strength, that he may make peace with me, and he shall make peace with me. Never think that God is like a human parent. When his child falls, the father presses him further down, calling him a dummy, and you always fail, and you're good for nothing. Don't ever think God is that way. No, God is reaching out his hand praying for you loving you still but he cannot save you unless you ask unless you respond so repent come back to God the Lord is long suffering to us not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance and so don't get discouraged especially at the first when you're learning to walk on the water if you fall into the water cry to God to lift you up again like Peter did right don't get discouraged the Lord bears long with us the Lord your God is gracious and will not turn away his face from you if you return to him God does not give us up because of our sins. We may make mistakes and grieve his spirit. But when we repent and come to him with contrite hearts, he will not turn us away. But there are hindrances to be removed. Wrong feelings have come in and there have been pride, self-sufficiency, impatience and murmurings. All these separate us from God. You see, sin separates from God. You've you've yielded back to Satan. Sin must be confessed. There must be a deeper work of grace. And if he will in humility confess them, then he may be restored. You see, God has to restore you to himself. Because you have gone away. Every day that you remain in sin, you are in Satan's ranks. And should you sicken and die without repentance, you would be lost. But remember, God gives you a chance to repent. Don't put it off, because Satan will make you think it's no use. Don't listen to him. Come back to God. Your only safety is in coming to Christ and ceasing from sin this very moment. The sweet voice of mercy is sounding in your ears today. But who can tell if it will sound tomorrow? Today is the day of salvation. 
Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. You have no guarantee for tomorrow. And this strange idea that only the 144,000 will finally be overcomers is, is not from the Bible or the spirit of prophecy. Anyone who dies in sin without being an overcomer is lost. Only the overcomers are saved. To every church all through the ages, Jesus says in Revelation, He that overcomes, he that overcomes, he that overcomes. Not just to Laodicea. It's the same message, the same gospel. From Adam's time to the very end, it's the same gospel. And that's what we've been trying to share with you. Our time is up again. I have one more quote. I think it's very important. The divine teacher bears with the erring through all their perversity. His love does not grow cold. His efforts to win them do not cease. With outstretched arms, he waits to welcome again and again the erring, the rebellious, and even the apostate. The one who is most easily tempted and is most inclined to err is the special object of his solicitude. Can you believe that? The one who is most easily tempted, he cares about the most. God loves us. He wants to save us, but he cannot save us in sin. He must save us from sin. Behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love, for your patience. Thank you for caring for each one. Oh, Father, help us to appreciate it and help us to respond to you moment by moment. Thank you, in Jesus' name. Amen.